All right then. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Mamagonian. To those of you who, who don't know me, I'm the Director of Academic Affairs here at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser. And I want to welcome you uh, here in person or online, however you are participating in tonight's event. And on behalf of the co-organizers of tonight's program, the Armenian Youth Federation and the AGBU Young Professionals, I want to say thank you for making time in your schedules and uh, joining us. When Kanar Krafian, to whom I will yield the microphone very shortly, came to us about 10 days ago and asked if we would host this event, we said yes, of course, and I very much want to commend her and the other representatives of these two groups for young Armenians for their leadership and their desire to organize the program. Uh, we hope too, of course, uh, for those of you who are new to Nasser, that you will learn more about our work, uh, attend some more of our events, whether in person or online, be find other ways to become involved, maybe even become members. You never know. If you have a questions or you're interested, please talk to me or to Silva Sadrakian, our executive director, who is holding up the back wall of the room. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you, even if it's for a somber uh, occasions such as this, and let me now turn the program over to Kanar and our esteemed panelists and friends. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for lowering the mic for me. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our panel this evening. Thank you to Nasser for hosting us physically and virtually. Um, and thank you to the AYF, Nasser, and AGBU Young Professionals for co-sponsoring the event. My name is Kanal Krafian. I'm a junior at Northeastern University, an AYF member, and I will be moderating the panel this evening. I know all our hearts are heavy with the loss of land and life in Artsakh the past few weeks. We've lost thousands of Armenian lives, and tens of thousands have been left handicapped. Azerbaijan has not tried to hide their ambitions of expanding their grasp into mainland Armenia and have been illegally capturing Artsakhsi government officials. Azeri hate crimes have found their way into diasporan communities, including our own here in Boston. This is a dire time for Armenians everywhere, and our goal with the panel this evening is to help educate diasporan Armenian youth on what is happening in Artsakh and what we can do next. We have three panelists with us this evening, and I would like to give you each a few minutes to introduce yourselves. Following intro introductions, I will ask the speakers a few questions, and then we will wrap up the conversation with a Q&A. Those on Zoom can put the questions in the chat, and those of you in person will be able to come up to the mic and ask your questions as well. Uh, Dikon, you can take it away, your intro. You want me to start? You can start. Uh, introduction for, uh, I'm Dikran Khaligyan. Um, I am a doctor of history, and uh, a longtime activist with the Armenian National Committee, uh, Eastern Region, and currently Armenian National Committee of Eastern Massachusetts, and uh, have been working on Artsakh-related issues for a number of years, uh, particularly on the political advocacy side, but of course also looking at the historical antecedents and how we got to the situation. Um, hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you, so such a privilege, and I, I really need it. <laughs> so thank you for the invitation for organizing this. Uh, my name is Anna Ohanian. I'm the Richard B. Finnegan Professor of International Relations at Stonehill College, and I also hold a, a non-resident non -resident position at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, I'm a two-times Fulbright Scholar, um, author of books um, and articles. Uh, my last book, um, that does try um, to explain as to what has happened. This was published in last year, The Neighborhood Effect, The Imperial Roots of Regional Fracture in Eurasia. And I do stand in front of you as a defeated scholar, I have to admit that. Uh, but I do hope that we'll talk about some of the deeper imperial legacies that still reverberate. Thank you. Good evening, and Kadar, thank you. Uh, First, thank you to the AYF and the AGBU Young uh, organizations for putting this together. Very important time. Um, I'm Anthony Barsamian. I'm co-chair of the Ar Armenian Assembly of America, which is a Washington-based organization doing U.S.-Armenia relations. So 
We are an American organization, Armenian American organization, 501c3. Um, I think you know, people in Boston certainly know me, but uh, I will just say that I'm an attorney here in, in, in uh, Massachusetts, and I've spent pretty much uh, a good part of my life advocating for Armenia and for Armenians around the world. Thank you. Uh, many of us are aware of what has happened in the last 10 days, and we will touch upon that. But to start off, um, can we briefly discuss the events that led up to the extensive ethnic cleansing we saw last week? How long has this plan been in the works for Azerbaijan? And do you think that the previous provocations were done with the events of last week as the ultimate goal? Dikran, you can start us off. My minister. Okay. Um, well, we know that Azerbaijan has long been planning this. The question is, why did it happen at this particular time? Um, things have changed drastically in the region, uh, primarily due to Russia's invasion of U Ukraine. That changed because Russia has always been the fulcrum. The, Russia has always tried to be the key player, balancing off the Azeris and the Armenians, and, and to force both sides to deal with them. However, things have changed since they've been so deeply involved in the the war in Ukraine, it is not going well for them, and suddenly their resources have been uh, limited. And so they seem to have basically, if not cut an explicit deal with Azerbaijan, essentially sent messages that they're willing to stay, step back. They're willing to allow to happen what, ha what would happen. And, the, and, this, and the, this was clear in 2022 when Azerbaijan attacked Sunik and Russia did nothing. Now this is not Artsakh, this is southern Armenia that was attacked. Some, uh, you know, the, the sovereign territory of Armenia itself. And that signal, I think, basically signaled to Azerbaijan, well, when, when the time is right, we can do, you know, we can finish off this plan. And this, of course, is a plan that Azerbaijan has had for years. Azerbaijan has always uh, wished not just to take Artsakh, but to take significant parts of Armenia as well. And we can probably talk about that a little more later. Uh, I agree with all of that analysis, Tigran. Uh, I would like to add another layer, another lens. Um, in my research, I look at armed conflict, uh, and I try to understand the trends um, around the world, which I do think are uh, important because they shape the global climate. Sort of, the, they shape the climate, so then we can understand the weather as to what's going to happen. What are these possible scenarios for a particular conflict? And looking at this data, or on average, and I hate to be throwing numbers at you at such a difficult time, but it is important that we approach at this in a systemic way. Um, this is a, the more modern form of this conflict, stage of this conflict is over 30 years. This is not a post-Soviet war, as I wrote in my book. This is a pre, obviously this has, uh, uh, pre-Soviet imperial roots, and you know this history be better than I do, perhaps. But what is important is that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, since the mid-90s, all the way until about 2008, there was an increase in armed conflicts around the world, but there was also an increase in negotiated settlements. Um, and this is a good outcome, to have conflicts ending in nego negotiated settlements. Over 40 percent of conflicts in that period ended with negotiated settlements. But the tide has turned since about 2008 or so, and the number of conflicts ending with victory consolidation is the sort of the jargon that conflict researchers use, um, has increased. So it looks like victory consolidation as an ending is back. And unfortunately, it is in that period, it's important to look at this global shift in trends that work against the possibility of negotiated settlement, but at the same time, the parallel issues, of course, is the oil economy inside Azerbaijan. And I don't think that it was Russia that was keeping the sort of the peace in that region. We tend to think that Armenia had a uh, uh, sort of a security because of Russia. I do believe, I don't believe, I have, um, I, I uh, do argue that Russia has always played an imperial game in the South Caucasus, meaning that it does not have a favorite. It always tried to engage both with Armenia, not engage, uh, provide uh, incentives and carrots and sticks as needed. But the oil prices were uh, rising, and whenever they started declining, in 2016 there was a drop, and that's when you saw an attack. So I think Azerbaijan chose to stay quiet, 
and really studied the trends, realizing that the tide is turning, that violence is possible. That's when uh, uh, Azerbaijan started increasingly using um, violence uh, much more openly. One quick point, and I'll uh, transfer this to Anthony. What stood out for me um, since the 2020, and after the 2022, perhaps the Russian invasion in Ukraine, um, is that Azerbaijan started using on the one hand, obviously this is an ethnic cleansing, but it's also important to highlight that Azerbaijan was using hybrid strategy, meaning using and trying to um, use kine non-kinetic forms of coercion, and the blockade very much came in that context to get what it wants, and using violence and attacking it, I hate to say it, I was, it, it was, it's a possible ending. Sri Lanka, this happened in Sri Lanka, this happened in Chechnya. Um, so it's a pretty, unfortunately, common way of ending. I did hope, uh, I did hope that considering that, uh, on the one hand, it was dangerous to have these two multiple tracks over the negotiation process. Um, and I did hope that it would be possible to get to a negotiated settlement with some rights. I think I was a, a bit naive, than, uh, much more than Tigran is. Um, but I do think this level of violence um, was possible. And um, uh, I, I just, um, uh, the, it's also critical to highlight, though, this militarization of Azerbaijani foreign policy, Azerbaijani policy should not be confused with its strength. And I hope that we'll talk about this, because this is, there are really deep internal weaknesses that are driving this behavior. It's nice to follow Dikran and Anna, <clears throat> because that's the historical perspective. Let me give you a bit of a, a today perspective. So obviously, uh, Armenia is vulnerable right now. And they're vulnerable because the international community failed to respond to all the warnings. And we gave those warnings. As a diplomat told me in Washington uh, last week, this was both predicted and predictable. The problem you have in the world currently is there are those trying to drive a peace agenda who said Armenia and Azerbaijan should have peace. And there were those in the world, spe specifically in the administration, who said this is a an up, uh, this is before they invaded this is a moment where we need to put international mechanisms on the ground in Artsakh to stop what could be an incursion i want to take you back a few weeks to the un general assembly i think the uh, we should not underestimate the azeris first of all the azeris as you know we're, we're we're going into the un general assembly with the blockade happening and every country knew that the Armenians of Artsakh were blockaded. And what did they do? They attacked. So instead of us talking about a 10-month blockade, the Security Council talked about the attack. Because the Azeri lobbyists and their lawyers said, let's change the, the narrative. The narrative changed at that moment, just like in 2016, from hunger, starvation, no fuel, blockade, to we have to take out the terrorist state, which is ridiculous. Armenians are a vulnerable population, surrounded Hungary with very few military for nine, 10 months, and they had to go in. And what they did is that was the final solution. So you're gonna hear me talk about ethnic cleansing. You're gonna hear me talk about war crimes. You're gonna hear me talk about final solution. Our Jewish friends should take notice. Our friends in Germany should take notice. This is the beginning of a new cycle. And I, I think at this moment in time, we need to warn the world it's starting again. If, if the Osiris get away with this war crime, I have no doubt we will see another uh, basket of uh, ethnic cleansings around the world. So that being said, I think, and, and Anna made a good point too, that in 2016, uh, the Armenians had defended a position in Artsakh which, which Ali have looked weak. There were protests on the street in Baku. He knew he had to do something. He's a dictator. He can't survive in a country unless he shows strength and put fear in the hearts of his people. And that's what he did. He attacked Ar Armenia, he attacked Artsakh with the understanding that at that moment, a military solution is where he was going. I think this does go back many, many years. I do think, and I'm gonna say this one thing to you all. I was shaped, and I think some of the uh, people in this room were shaped by the uh, earthquake of 1988. 
That was the moment when Armenia had a real uh, humanitarian crisis on their hands. This generation, all of you are gonna be shaped by this, by the, what, what happened in Artsakh over the last month. This is your moment. I was fortunate enough, enough to go to Armenia first in 1987, so I went during the Soviet period, and then every year I've seen the development of Armenia. But I do think that this is longstanding, as both Dikran said and, and Anna said, and what we have to do is look at this in the context of what's going on in the world and how we, Armenian Americans and Armenians around the world, are gonna change the way we look at ourselves in the context of, of, um, of the, the, the loss of Artsakh. Not total loss, but the immediate loss. Thank you, all of you, for giving us context. Um, now moving forward a little bit, there's a small lack of Western journalism in Artsakh, and most of the news that we've received in the last month has come from word of mouth from people on the ground and Armenian organizations. A common issue discussed among Armenian youth is that it's been difficult to find out what's happening in Artsakh and where we can look for news. Could one of you or multiple of you um, touch on what actually happened in the last 10 days before the mass exodus out of Artsakh? I'll, I'll jump in on this simply again. I do find that comparative context is, is important. Within political science, there's this new phenomenon that we're trying to understand. Well, look, on the one hand, we're saying some conflicts are ending in a negotiated settlement, some are ending through victory consolidation in a military form, but there's also, there's a type of conflict called that are ending through authoritarian conflict management. What does this mean? This means that the government who is using the violence to control the ethnic group, a particular ethnic group, um, is trying to use a specific strategy to essentially pacify. This is not peace building, there's no conflict management. But in this context, there's one specific uh, strategy that plays, connects with that question, Naidi, which is discourse, discursive control, meaning kill the journalist. In the case of the Russian war in Chechnya, there are over 45 uh, journalists that were killed reporting on the human rights abuses in Chechnya. In the case of the Sri Lanka conflict in the Tamil region, there are over 20 journalists were killed. Turkey, in dealing with the Kurdish conflict, there it created over 72 security zones that uh, made it difficult for journalists to access. The same was happening, obviously, in Artsakh. Why do they do it? To control the information, to control the so the, the, the discourse, to shape the narrative, right? So are this national self-determination, is this a national self-determination that is happening here? No, these are terrorists. And the label of the terrorist, it was a matter of time when Aliyev started applying, um, which again, unfortunately, it has been typical. After 9-11, 9-11 was a gift basket to a lot of authoritarian states with ethnic issues in their society. So they just applied the label without obviously the muddling the discourse on national self-determination rights. So in this context, uh, there are no journalists allowed, but even before this, when Russian peacekeepers uh, actually entered, since then the information was controlled. Um, I have been to Artsakh once, and I tried to go again. That time I had Fulbright. I would not be allowed. Um, even without that, it, it was very difficult. Uh, Western journalists, I talked to Western journalists in Yerevan, and they were saying, no, there's no way we, we, could be, we would be let in. Few select diaspora individuals were uh, being allowed in. So. Much of the reporting was happening to, by really young and amazing and incredibly articulate uh, young people your age that had podcasts, they were sending messages, and so that was the source of the information. Um, so yeah, and I think um, relying on those voices is important, so now some of those voices are now in Armenia, so hopefully they'll find their uh, in Armenia. And actually, let me take this in a, in a cover another piece, this is the issue of Western journalism. Um, for the last two weeks, the New York Times, Boston Globe, America, the American media is covering it because now there's ethnic cleansing. It's a humanitarian crisis. Where the hell have they been for the last 11 months? I mean, think about this. Now all of a sudden they're interested. And similarly, all of a sudden the State Department is taking it more seriously too. Where have they been? Ever since last December, 
Armenians around the world have been knocking, knocking on the door saying ethnic cleansing is coming. This is a potential another genocide. And we were treated like, oh, the, the boy who cried wolf. Well, guess what? It just happened. 100,000 people basically being forcibly ejected. And of course, even the media manages to make it, oh, well, they're, they're leaving, they feel they're not safe, as if it's entirely voluntary, but, you know, otherwise. But w had, had the West, w whether through journalism or through this, or th di diplomatically, been paying attention and, and actually responding, this could have been prevented. It's only once it's already happened, and now all of a sudden, okay, well, we know how to do humanitarian relief, you know, maybe we'll send some money, maybe we'll do this. But the problem has been that unless it's in determined to be somehow in America's interest, America's immediate interest, the way that Ukraine is in America's immediate interest, because of course it, it weakens Russia by supporting Ukraine, they just didn't want to cover it. And that's probably the single most frustrating item um, that we as Armenians feel, that we as activists feel that this, could, this should have been an issue in December, in January, in April, each time when you had a, a, an entire population being starved, not being allowed to leave, not having any access to medicine, that it wasn't, big, it wasn't important enough to cover. Now all of a sudden, okay, yeah, we'll give you some coverage. I would just say that um, I was lucky enough to get information during that time from the leadership of Artsakh, and as you can see, they've now rounded up all the leadership. I mean, Ruben Vardanyan, Arkady Gukasin, David Babayan, these are people that we knew, and they're all arrested now. So that's how we got information. Um, the UN tried to get in to send a monitoring group. Azerbaijan would have nothing of it. And to Dikran's point, who condemned it? I mean, nobody condemned the full blockade of news, food, everything, uh, energy. Uh, it went on for nine months. Uh, so, yeah, no, I think that's, it's been a huge problem, one that I think we need to learn the lesson of. If, if Sunik is vulnerable, we need to get as much infrastructure, international organizations, uh, countries uh, setting up shop in Sunik. Why don't they go into Sunik anymore? Because the monitors. Because you have about 100 European monitors there. We need U.S. monitors there. We need Canadian monitors there. We need South American monitors there. I mean, we need all these countries to go in, and we need to go in and, and invest into Sunik, because that is a part of Armenia right now. So I think what I'll do is I'll keep pushing the discussion of what we lack there. We, we, can afford, we cannot afford to lack in Armenia. We need, we need intense investment in Armenia, specifically in the South, to demonstrate that we're here to stay and no one's going to penetrate Armenia. Thank you again. Um, and to our next question, a lot of people have been curious about what the process was like of actually leaving Artsakh and going to Armenia. I'm not sure if you know the answer to this question, but do you know if there were checkpoints, how many um, were they allowed to bring things with them, what weren't they allowed to bring, and what happened once they got to Armenia? I, I, I don't think... Um, let me speak for myself. I don't have the right to speak about it, simply because I cannot, I can imagine as to what they've been through. I can try to extrapolate watching other conflict cases, but I just cannot put myself, it's heartbreaking, uh, but just looking and watching uh, the photos and the videos coming out, uh, two, let, let me actually give you two images. On the one hand, it's hard people essentially stuffing everything they can into a car, uh, but th at the same time, there's this very positive, uplifting images that are coming. Um, kids finally safe, and as a mom, my fellow, that's great that they're out. And there are kids going into Armenian schools, being um, uh, hugged and integrated. There are all those images as well. And I know these are really difficult time, and they are. Um, but, and this is a little bit personal. My daughter and I, who is your age, were talking about uh, t things were tough. She's like, why should I have hope? Or what is hope? Isn't it being hopeful? Isn't it that being naive? Isn't it better to be pragmatic and realistic? I said, let me think about this. Um, hope is how politicians campaign on and they are successful, they mobilize people on it. Hope is religion. 
that again mobilizes people. But most importantly, when you're hopeful, not idealistic, hopeful, it unlocks your brain and you start seeing in terms of scenarios. You start seeing possibilities. And in that respect, being hopeful is critical in order to have a really um, sophisticated, uh, diverse uh, decision making in, an, in any situation. And I could not agree with you more, Anthony, about Sunik. Sunik is gorgeous. Sometimes I'll, uh, when I go to Armenia, um, I'll, I, I'll hang out in Yerevan, I hang out in Bajini village, which is north of Yerevan. But for the past few years, I built a habit of going to do my vacations in Sunik. And it's, I cannot, it's just extremely beautiful. But every time I'll come to Armenia, I'll start arguing with my relatives. How come you're not going to Sunik? Oh, like a taxi driver will say, oh, Sunik is so dangerous. So it's like, hello. Uh, Armenians in, in the U.S. are saying Armenia is dangerous, but a driver in Yerevan is saying Sunik is dangerous. So we really have to get out of that mindset that Sunik is, uh, Sunik is dangerous. It's dangerous if you don't go. We have agency here, incredible agency here. Um, develop, actually, I was thinking about that as well, Anthony. All this foreign aid that was coming, uh, which I, I was hoping there'd be a little bit more, but I, looking at the way foreign aid infrastructure has been deployed in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which I studied in 1990s, early 2000s, there are a lot of NGOs that come in. Granted, about 40% of that foreign aid that came to Bosnia, 40% left it in forms of payments of consultants and overheads for transnational big NGOs. But honestly, if it comes to this, to Armenia, I would like for some of those NGOs, for the USAID that, uh, I don't know, the, the did what, $11 million and says, I don't, like some of my major NGOs are gonna come and implement it. Please be my guest. Absolutely, but station yourself in Sunik. So um, I do, and I try to nudge, I don't have access to Armenian government, but people who do talk to Armenian government saying, this is a low hanging fruit, direct and create a cluster in Sunik for, the, um, for some of this NGO assistance to go there with organizations present there. Um, and of course, the advantage of integrating local NGOs, local civil society is going to be huge, but then I'll stop here, it is going to, um, I'm touched, Anthony, as to how the uh, uh, earthquake shaped your life. I was on the <laughs> receiving end of that. But I think now, I mean, this is a now a 30-year-old state. So this refugee, I don't want to call it a crisis. It'll be difficult. We're right now in the stage of humanitarian immediate assistance provision, and it needs to shift into development. And we, Armenian state needs to think as to how it needs to be done. But I think as you join in in this effort, this can be also, it comes out of a horrible, horrendous crisis, but it can be an enormous opportunity uh, for the Armenian state. These people that came in, they're hardworking, uh, they're smart, intelligent. Um, this, this is human capital. This is human capital. We just have to invest in, in these people and integrate them. Uh, there's a lot of know-how how refugee integration is, is being done. Um, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we have to be smart and uh, pretty technocratic about it. I'll just add this. I, you know, people have asked me, how are you doing this? Because obviously all of us are under uh, immense uh, uh, stress. All of you are too, by the way with this conflict. Anna is from Armenia, from Margahovit, I know that. So I, I, it, she feels it different than I feel it. But I will tell you, my neighbor, a personal story, my neighbor is Artsakhsi, Sherburne, Massachusetts, who would guess? She, uh, the little Hovanas brings me uh, jingle of hats every once in a while across the street. Anyway, their family in, uh, in Stepanakert, um, when the explosion happened, their uncle was in the explosion. They can't find him. I'm sure, you know, it's not a good story there. But when you hear the, just the pain of like trying to look for their uncle and then leave and, and not leave with their uncle. So uh, you want to know what it feels like? I think that's what it feels like. It feels like a, a real sense of deep, deep loss. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is regarding crossing the border, as Anthony pointed out, a number of the leaders of, political leaders of Artsakh have been arrested. Uh, they're being arrested as they try to leave the country. Um, it's premature to make any, fi you know, to make any analysis yet, but what I would ask everyone to do is keep an eye on who has been arrested and who got through of former political or military leaders of Artsakh. And I think that's something that's gonna require some analysis down the road is who are the Azeris letting through. 
Thank you. And Anna, you kind of went into my next question of can Armenia support 100,000 refugees um, and is the government willing and able to do so? Um, I know you already talked about it. So Anthony or Deacon, if you want to. I'll just say a lot of this depends on us. This is our moment. I, I always say Armenians are reactionary, we're not proactive. This is our chance, and especially for your generation, to be proactive. If we build Armenia properly now, and we learn from the lessons of the last 30 years, a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. I used to say before the war, Armenia cannot afford to make mistakes. And we made mistakes, unfortunately. That's why we're here. Your generation cannot afford one mistake. And one thing we can all do is work together as one community. I've never worked with more Armenians in my life across political parties, across churches. Not, and by the way, those were all there. We were working together. But now the information is free flowing. Whoever can get the job done gets the job done. Um, and I have some thoughts on this which we're going to put into action soon with all the other affiliated organizations. But that being said, I think it really is a moment to build uh, Sunik, to build uh, Armenia the right way. How many schools are they going to need? How many hospitals? How much infrastructure are they going to need? We need to go to the United States, to Europe, those countries, and say triple the numbers you're giving us. It's got to be north of a billion dollars. So that being said, we will fill the holes. If the US builds housing and Europe builds infrastructure and hospitals, we can build social programs. We can build, uh, um, even here in the diaspora, I've already started thinking about, you bring teachers here for training and rotate them back to Armenia. We can do that in Boston. We have infrastructure. We have great people here. Other cities can do things, medical institutions. We can become the brains for Armenia, but we have to act fairly quickly. Because what we're seeing, and I think Dikran said it, you know, the Azeris, they saw what was happening and they're playing off our weaknesses. So I will not tell you the playbook up here today, but I think there should be a very strong strategic playbook to build the infrastructure of Armenia. Do you yeah. and I mean, I, I'd agree with, with what Anthony said. And, 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 and take it one step further, there's an additional problem because they're coming, the refugees are coming from Artsakh. The majority, they're not, urban, they're not from urban areas. I mean, the biggest problem in Armenia for the last 30 years is depopulation of the Marzas because there aren't enough jobs, there isn't, nobody can make a livelihood right. there. Now is the time, I mean, it should have been done. I mean, the last three Armenian governments should have been doing this. We have, there has to be a buildup of jobs and opportunities outside of Yerevan. Because you can't take somebody who's lived their entire life as a farmer or as a shepherd and then plop them in the middle of Yerevan and expect them to be able to s prosper. So those opportunities have to be there. That's not only going to assist those, those refugees, it's also going to assist Armenia. Because you don't need your you know, three quarters of your population in one urban uh, thing. It's not good for the country and it's not good strategically. Yeah. It's not just Sunik, it's all your border regions. Remember, they didn't just attack Sunik, they also attacked, uh, they, they, attacked in, they attacked in the north as well. The more population you have along the, in the border regions and the, keep those areas populated, the less, the less strategically vulnerable they'll be. Thank you again. And speaking of border regions, um, some people may be aware of the corridor that Azerbaijan and Turkey are trying to build along the southern border. Um, and we were wondering if you believe that is a threat to Armenian statehood and Armenian population. Can I take that? <laughs> Simply because I have been uh, uh, racking my brains uh, over that issue. On the one hand, and again my research is on regional stability, regional integration, right? And the economic data says that small states like Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan usually economically do better when they're integrated because their market size is small, but that's in the normal world, right? We're not talking about a region divided by conflict. This particular corridor, um, I don't even want to call it, the, use the terminology that uh, Aliyev has introduced, which Western journalists are repeating, um, the, that what, he's, what is in the agreement, with the November 9 agreement, there is nothing there about an extraterritorial corridor. It's about connectivity. It's about providing Azerbaijan 
um, with, with connectivity to Nahujevan, which I think if it is done within the framework of liberal rules-based world order, within the framework of state sovereignty, within the framework of sovereign uh, territorial integrity, that would be good for Armenia. Armenia's economy has been under a blockade and it has not uh, uh, it has been growing, but not, it's, it, it, it needs a breakthrough. The same for Georgia, even though Georgia had its democratic breakthrough in 2003 and had so much foreign assistance coming to it from Europe, its economy, and it has uh, geographical position and tourism and the resorts, Georgia's economy did not take off, right? So, but what Azerbaijan wants now it is not unblocking, which Armenia has offered. As, uh, Azerbaijan wants an tr extraterritorial corridor. Is it dangerous? Yes, it is. Because what it does, Azerbaijan essentially by wanting this extraterritorial corridor, so Armenian, there are no Armenian checkpoints, Armenians don't check to see what's coming in and out. What will this become is later on, um, uh, there could be a way to uh, uh, exercise attack create a crisis here, crisis there. Um, you cannot invade like Russia did. There would be a uh, war of conquest, sanctions, it's, it's bad. But if you do it a little bit, salami slicing is what it's called, this is what that strategy is. The fact that Aliyev is calling this as a Zangiz corridor, that's not the administrative terminology for Armenia, it's unique, right? Indicates that its intentions are not benign. Uh, moreover, um, I do think that by doing it coercively and uh, with Russia's support and Turkey's support, that essentially right now, and I think we should be using that argument when speaking to the West, United States in particular, that this is not only important for Armenia, please, please, please come help us. If the United States and the West do not establish a framework of unblocking this region, creating this regional connectivity and allow this to be done coercively through extraterritorial corridor, uh, United States and the West is losing transparent um, uh, rules-based access to the Eurasian continent. Everything from Russia-Ukraine war, from Taiwan, U.S.'s connectivity to India, all of that will be affected. So uh, while politically Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, it was an uphill battle to get a status, to get rights, for Nagorno-Karabakh, this is very straightforward. It's an international border, and it is in the interest of the West to protect that border. Um, I'll stop here, but I, uh, but I do think um, Armenia, and I haven't seen, uh, um, I do think there has to be a crisp language, a vision, as to what would an unblocked region within the framework of international law, what would it look like for everybody in the region? Why is it that Aliyev is not taking it, right? and we just wants no connectivity but corridor. That's what Azerbaijan wants. And I do think the Armenian needs to be, uh, needs to clarify loudly what it is offering. But this is in the interest of the West to protect Sunik and to protect that international border. Sorry. I, I have one line on this. I asked last night because I was hearing that, oh, they're, they're gonna negotiate something. First of all, it'll never be a corridor. The transit routes or whatever, I've heard that, or connectivity, those are nice words, but it, it is Armenian territory. But I asked the question um, through an intermediary to the Armenian government, I, and this is what I got in response. We will, uh, we will fight till the last man and woman rather than give a quarter to Azeris, period. We are not giving a quarter. There is no quarter. There won't be a quarter. It's Armenian land, and it will be always Armenian land. And if there's transit, it would mean opening, latching, letting Armenians go back, right to return, absolutely, with international guarantees and peacekeepers so that Armenians can live in peace in Artsakh and go back, and then we'll open up routes for our transit across Armenia under the control of Armenian uh, sovereignty. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, ex an extraterritorial corridor is unacceptable. There's no question, because again, Azerbaijan's goal is to take Sunik. And that's simple, it's something we need to, that we have to stress to the West. And the, first of all, let me put my historian hat on. Uh, the only reason Sunik is even part of Armenia is because in 1918, General Antonik fought for it and threw the Azeris out. Otherwise, that wasn't, wouldn't have even been part of the Independent Republic in 1918. 
It took a, it took phys, it took uh, it took military intervention to do it. And so, so number one, as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, that's their land. It's always been there. They'll call it Western Azerbaijan or Zangezur or whatever they want. But um, so number one, it's got to, it's got has we have to make clear that the, Azerbaijan is not going to be satisfied with Artsakh. That's just the first step for them. They need to create as, as weak, if they're not going to eliminate Armenia at completely, as weak and subservient in Armenia as possible. And one clear way to do that would be to cut, cut uh, Armenia off from its only real outside route, which is to the south through Sunik to Iran. And that's where we run into the other problem when we're dealing with Western diplomacy, and particularly with the State Department, because Iran is radioactive to the State Department. Oh, well, Armenia, you don't want to be too close. Yeah, but Iran is Armenia's only outlet, and Iran is the only power outside who's actually willing to stand up and say, no, Azerbaijan, you can't have Sunni because it's against Iran's interests. So here's where we constantly run into an issue. Every so often, the State Department gets, a, you know, are, is somewhat pragmatic and says, okay, uh, we, we understand why you have to trade with Iran, you have to work with Iran, we'll turn a blind eye, whatever. But unfortunately, the America's and, and Israel's obsession with Iran ends up coming to bite Armenia in the butt because uh, Arme Iran is our only real ally when it comes to dealing with, with Azerbaijan, and particularly it's because of Sunni. One thing on that, Tikran. Uh, I think historically, you're right that Iran and the U.S. have not played. Um, I'm seeing change. I mean, you don't give $4 billion or release $4 billion to a government just for a few hostages. Things are changing, and I think that Iran is going to play in very prominently into Armenia's future, and the U.S. will play in prominently into Armenia's future. Just to also highlight, uh, just piggyback on that, that only Iran's and Western uh, West's position on territorial integrity in that region, uh, it, it coincides. Uh, Russia, Turkey, I forgot to mention that Russia actually wants this corridor because it wants a sanction-free transit to connect with Turkey. So Russia, Turkey, and Azerbaijan would like this kind of new imperial uh, type of connectivity, fuzzy borders, no rules, right? Um, but only, uh, but Iran and West are speaking the same language for a variety of reasons, but they both actually protect, speak in the language of state sovereignty. Can I add a few thoughts, just a few more points on Azerbaijan? I do agree with all the assessments on Azerbaijan. Absolutely. But keep, it is important for us to also understand the type of statehood or the lack thereof that is built in Azerbaijan, or not built actually in Azerbaijan, because that presents dangers and opportunities, not just for Armenia, but also for Georgia. What you have, and I'm actually citing, a, there's a lot of research that I have at home and I forgot to bring some of the statistics on the oil decline, which will run out in five years. Azerbaijan is already selling Russian oil because it cannot provide, um, cannot sell to Europe and, um, uh, and provide the needs of its own citizens. Um, the, uh, the much discussed as a diversified Azerbaijan saving Europe, Azerbaijan provides less than 3% of Europe's needs. I think the way the, Europe, the way the European actors, and we know who have been uh, discussing the oil diplomacy, the energy diplomacy, it's, uh, I'm just gonna be being benevolent, I'll just say maybe they just did not do their research, but it's the cat is out of the bag. Every researcher, now it's out, it's common knowledge, that Azerbaijan is not, a, is not diversifying Europe's economy in terms of energy sources that Azerbaijan is running out of oil, right? Now, what does that mean domestically inside Azerbaijan? Um, even on, during the oil boom that Azerbaijan ha has experienced in 2000, in that process, it went through massive deindustrialization and reprimization. Uh, I'm not pronouncing the, uh, the terminology correctly. The economy become Actually, yeah, the primarization, the economy became primitive. Azerbaijan's second export after oil and gas is tomatoes. So behind every strong man, there are weak institutions. Always remember that. The same applies for Russia. And we saw how that nakedness of institutions resulted in this disastrous war for Russia, which 
it essentially was self-sabotage for that state. Forget the impact on Ukraine and the spillover that we're witnessing here. So Azerbaijan is a rentier state. It's not just an authoritarian state. It's not China. It's a personalized authoritarian autocratic state. Um, leaders, and trust me, there's research on this, Leaders in those types of states do not die in bed. That's how political scientists talk about it. There's always military coup. We already see Africa going through this. So as the oil runs out, the social contract that you keep your mouth shut, the state will give you basic, uh, basic, basic provision, that contract is not going to be sustainable. Russia has oil just fine. Kazakhstan has lots of oil. If countries have oil, they're fine. But Azerbaijan, not even the green transition is a factor here because it's not just Azerbaijan has to uh, diversify because the green transition is coming. Azerbaijan just does not have oil, period. So as a militarized state, but institutionally weak state, um, what as the way Azerbaijan is using nationalism is it's cheaper for these types of leaders to use external enemy, which is why Azerbaijan needs a conflict. It's, that's why it's going to constantly probe the border. It's cheaper for them to create this nationalism as opposed to suppress the population domestically. So under, this, is a, this, is a, this is dangerous, but it also provides opportunities. And Georgia has been just standing on the sideline, and I continue to find that problematic and strategically short-sighted on their part. Thank you. Um, it was a very educational conversation there. And moving forward, um, what are effective actions that we can take now to help? Um, and what are more long-term efforts we need to begin thinking about? We heard the mention of investing in SUNIC multiple times. What else can be done? I, I, I dominated the conversation. So no, I'll just say that you know, I traveled to Armenia. I was in SUNIC. I was in Goris uh, in July. Uh, my kids go to Goris. Uh, uh, the Servan starts something in Goris. My, my daughter's on the board of a school in Goris that teaches English. Um, go there and do a project there, right? There's no substitute as an Armenian American or as an Armenian around the world to just go and do something. As much as I love being in Watertown, which is an amazing place, there's no better place to, to express yourself as an Armenian than in the homeland. So go there, and if we can help, I think the three of us all are connected in multiple ways to get you involved. I loved what Tikran said about the rural communities because that speaks to my heart because I'm on the board of the Armenian Tree Project. So we are gonna develop hundreds and hundreds of farmers and we will develop the rural uh, economy. So if you live in Marduni and you are a farmer, please come to, go, uh, to the outskirts of Sunik and we'll set up a farm for you and, and that's the way it's gonna work. We're gonna all have to be very sophisticated, but move swiftly, right? This is not gonna be something we can plan for 10 years. This is two years, a year and a half, six months. So whatever we can get on the ground, and if you all go on the ground, it's gonna be very hard for anybody or the US government to, to not defend Americans in Sunik region. So I, I gotta give my uh, hats off to James Tufankin because his new hotel is gonna be a hotel in the Sunik region. It's a wine hotel. And those kind of things are what we need. We need more investment. I'd be the happiest person if Microsoft puts a, uh, its, its division in that region, in the Sunik region. Yeah, and I mean, I'd agree with that. And I mean, there are multiple projects that have already, some that have already started or ones that already exist that now need to be uh, moved, say, into Sunik or other border regions. I mean, the AYF has its, uh, its camp in Camp Javakh, where in, in the Javakh region of Georgia, you're actually doing something on the ground for kids there. That, those types of projects now have to be spread within the rural areas of Armenia. It's the same type idea, but now do it so that the, the children of that region now have something to do in the summer and have a connection with the Armenian diaspora. That would be one. Um, thinking, thinking more, more long-term, one, th one of the real uh, problems that have been exposed in the last five years is the, is the military um, lacks, uh, you know, the, the deficits of, of Armenia. Um, one of the things that should have been done in the last 30 years but hasn't, and now I think we have to, is we should have our own defense industry in Armenia. Why has it taken us so long? 
when you're already surrounded on three sides by enemies, yes, you can import a certain amount, but number one, you don't have that much money. But number two, it's up to us in the diaspora to help Armenia develop its own defense industry. Just as the Turks make their drones and sell it and send it to Azerbaijan, just as, just as Israel makes drones and sends it to Azerbaijan, we should, be, you know, we should be developing our own industries, help Armenia develop its own defense industry so it can defend itself because this story is not gonna end in a year or two. Thank you very much. Um, and to wrap up the prepared questions um, and plug a couple events as well, AYF is hosting a demonstration on Saturday where we intend to educate non-Armenians in Harvard Square, and Zoravig is hosting an event every Thursday through October from 2 to 6 p.m. at the JFK Federal Building where they intend to do the same. Um, what are main points we and Armenians in general should be bringing up when we talk to people who are uneducated on this issue, and what should we avoid? That's such a good question. That's a very good question. I don't, and I don't have a good answer. And I'm going to, whenever I have colleagues that come to my office, are you okay? Maybe I can give you that answer. So what is the quick things that I tell them? I always do try um, to frame things in a way that the West can understand as to how it relates to them. Right now, I think it's bad for United States, but unfortunately, much of the, most of the policymakers and the media, they look at the world through Russia-Ukraine glasses. And that's a very, very important event. I think Russian invasion in Ukraine is a war of conquest. As such, it's very bad for Armenia, first of all, because it's anti-systemic. It challenges the rules. It is justified on imperial logic that Russia is entitled to this land because of X, Y, Z historical reasons. Now, how does it relate to Armenia? And I'm, I think what Azerbaijan is trying to do is to build a Donbas conflict in the Sunni region and use that as a launch pad and say, no, 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 we did not invade. Right? This is just got out of control. It was just a uh, uh, limited annexation. So I think trying to tell this story in global terms and how it relates to the West, the Western needs, is really important. Actually, I just had a conversation in my class. We're having a debate, um, Russia-Ukraine war. And uh, I was asking them, are you going to support, as a voter, the, uh, the, the, Russian support, the, the American support for Ukraine? And understanding, framing this as to how it matters um, is really to, to the West is key. And as I mentioned already, I won't go there again, um, Sunik is not an Armenian issue only. Sunik is a Western issue because right in that tiny strip, two forms of order are being uh, uh, clashing together. Liberal, very limited, liberal rules-based world order, and the new imperial geopolitics, not just geopolitics, it's new imperial geopolitics of Russia and Turkey that thrives on fuzzy rules, no rules, fuzzy borders, no borders. So I think that tiny strip of border, if the West loses it, that will shape the capacity of the West in maintaining influence in that continent. I was just gonna say, I think, Saturday was good for me because it, it allowed me to like frame the argument and I hope it helped you but Aliyev is a war criminal. Aliyev is an ethnic cleanser. He has cleansed Azerbaijan of its minority Armenian population. He had a responsibility to, to defend those people and he failed. Hate speech. Look at the, the, uh, the legal terminology around ethnic cleansing. Follow all those principles. Tell, look at, hate speech is like huge in America, right? I was arguing, don't, don't go to the bank with me because I was arguing with a Jewish leader. I said, you have lost every moral compass you have. You have lost it. Your country will go down the tubes if you do not defend Armenians in Armenia. Why? Because you can't talk about hate speech and about uh, no place for hate and about uh, uh, never again if you don't defend Armenia right now. He is a war criminal, period. And this is ethnic cleansing. Americans understand those terms. And you can say, we are trying to prevent, and by the way, Armenia is a democracy, and Azerbaijan is an autocracy. So you say, we are a small island of democracy in a sea of autocrats and dictators. So you want the, you want the buzzwords? 
You just heard them. Use them and get out there and do something about it. By the way, I just, got, I just saw a note that uh, the Prime Minister of Armenia is still going to the talks in Grenada without Azerbaijan. Great move. He's going to meet with the European leaders and he's going to negotiate with them. Because why? Because Armenia is a democracy and we belong with European leaders. And we don't belong with autocrats. So let him go to Europe. Let him come to the United States. Let, let Tony Blinken go to Armenia right now. And he should go to Armenia. That would be the best thing. So anything we can do to promote Armenia as a free, democratic, smart country versus the cesspool around it is what we're trying to do. ICC, do you want to add ICC to that? There you go. ICC, which is, the, is how you keep uh, ethnic cleansing. And I'm sure, I said it Saturday, but they, I'm sure Armenia is working on a, on a case to bring to the ICC. Yeah, that's, that's why they actually initiate it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I agree, but I, I would just I would add to, uh, to what Tony said. Aliyev's not the only war criminal, so is Elekta. I mean, this isn't just Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan militarily could not have won in 2020 without Turkey. This is a NATO ally of the United States who was directly involved. Their pilots were there. Their weapons were there. Their, army, their military advisors were there. They're the ones who planned out the, the, the military strategy that won, them in 20, that won that war in 2020. And so the way I would connect it is actually, I mean, actually last night I was speaking to um, you know, I'm part of the Genocide Education Project. Each year we take 15 American teachers to Armenia to the Genocide Museum and Institute and make them experts to come back and teach other teachers how to teach genocide. And of course, they, you know, they're all asking about Artsakh. And the lesson I have for them is what makes Turkey and Azerbaijan, what unites Turkey and Azerbaijan besides plain old hatred of Armenians? It's the genocide. The number one and number two biggest genocide denialist countries of the world are Turkey and Azerbaijan. That what we've said to the American, to every, everyone in this country who's wanted to, who's actually bothered to listen to us is, as long as Armenia has an unrepentant genocidal state next door, who still has the, the, the consequences of genocide hanging over their head, Armenia will never be secure. So it's not just Azerbaijan, it's Turkey as well. They are both guilty of war crimes, they are both responsible for this ethnic cleansing, and they both need to be held accountable. That would be the message I would give uh, on Saturday. I'll make one clarification, by the way, because I've been going a little hard lately because I'm, I'm not happy. But let's be honest, uh, the, I feel badly for the people of Azerbaijan. I feel badly for the people of Georgia. I certainly feel badly for the Russian people. So the point is, it's not the people, it's the leadership. When I talk about the cesspool, it's the, the just the absolute disgraceful way that free countries have dealt with these dictators and autocrats. We really have to change what's going on. This week, they renamed a street in Stepanakert after uh, uh, Enver Pasha. I mean, how sick is that? And the world is going to let that happen? Are we going to have Adolf Hitler Boulevard someday in Germany when the Germans get soft? Come on, wake up, world. That's our job. We have to wake these people up. Agreed. And in fact, I mean, there is a Talat Pasha street in Guy City. And I mean, and, and to correct myself, I said Elekta is Erdogan is the, is the war criminal. I, I, I could see something in Mark's face. I said something wrong, but yeah. So it's, 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 it's well, as I call it, Sultan Tayyip Erdogan, who has been the real mastermind behind this whole thing. He knew his Azerbaijani cousins couldn't do it on his own, so he went and he helped. Thank you very much. This has been very educational. These are great points to bring up for all of us to take with us as we demonstrate um, in the next few weeks and when we speak to our colleagues and friends who are unaware of the situation. Um, we do have a couple questions from the chat to go off of this, uh, which we can lead off with, and then we can get in-person questions. Um, one, of, one of them being, the, there's a saying that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. However, in this situation, America's interests are with our enemies. Why do you trust the US? I'll, I'll take it. Um, United States, when I, when I say liberal rules-based world order, that does not mean that there is this global court created by the United States that is dispensing justice and then the justice comes swift. That's not what that means. 
liberal rules-based world order actually is not created by the United States. The early champions of these values, norms against conquest, that you don't invade your country, uh, uh, you don't invade your neighbor's country, uh, territorial sovereignty and sovereign equality, that in the world states that are small and large uh, are equal. Um, those norms actually have come from Latin America because they were small states when they emerged as political entities and they advocated hard because they were afraid that the United States will invade and attack them at that time. However, the United States played an important role after World War II in creating, uh, with its hegemony, in creating that liberal rules-based world order, which benefited a lot of, lot of states, provided stability, provided, crystallized those norms for, uh, against conquest, the peaceful coexistence, human rights started emerging. Um, if we did not have those organizations, if we did not have that international law, no matter how weak, Armenia would not exist as a state. The world map would look very different. United States is a power. It's actually ironic. Sometimes people, uh, especially when I outside of United States, you will hear, "Oh, United States is promoting democracy." It's like, and I was like, "I wish United States promoting demo was promoted democracy." <laughs> United States has never been consistent on promoting democracy, and I don't believe in democracy being exported. The fact that Armenia's democracy is so strong despite all these challenges because people actually was grassroots, people were at the front, forefront of it. And then the interesting question is why and how were people like that? And there are deep civic legacies. Like your great great parents probably were like that, that it carried over, and Armenians um, uh, want, uh, the, uh, wanted to build the type of institutions to determine who is going to govern them. And that is the engine of state building. Now, back to United States. United States, with all its flaws and the Western power, um, they absolutely exploited the world. But again, they stand for this rules based world order. For small states to prosper, you need predictability. You need the rules that are created. And as a strong military power, still United States, the West still is the big engine um, of the world economy. The China's rise, um, that actually creates an interesting dynamic there. But I, looking at the neighborhood, I definitely, with all the risks, I definitely would support um, I, I, I'm, <laughs> we did not even talk about it. I'm not advocating for a pivot. It's a different conversation. But I think there are very numerous reasons as to why uh, to go after United States. But we cannot wait for and expect uh, the saviors that someone is going to come and give us security. Uh, no state is going to do it. It's costly. Security has to be created from the bottom up. That means at some point we have to negotiate with all of this unsavory uh, political elite with which we're surrounded. And there are other mechanisms with which United States also can actually uh, play a role. I, the sanctions, I do think on Azerbaijan, I have a feeling, I'm speculating, uh, that they do keep that as the nuclear option should Azerbaijan and Turkey do anything on the border. But I don't know. It's my opinion. I'm speculating. I have no first knowledge on that. Um, next question. Uh, I agree that we should help Armenia build its defense industry, but what can we in the diaspora do specifically? Well, it's not for individual. Basically, if it's going to happen, it's going to require investment from the diaspora. I mean, financially, Armenia can't do it it's on its own. So essentially, it would require the diaspora to help Armenia do that. And I mean, Lord knows, you know, enough diaspora and Armenians have built enough different, uh, uh, different things in Armenia. Let this be one more. Instead of, building a, instead of building a restaurant, build a factory, work with others, you know, do it. In, you know, I mean, obviously, it's not something you can do, heb jeb, you know, however you want. It's got to be planned out. It's got it's to be done strategically. But that would be something that uh, it would require the diaspora to actually take the lead working with people in Armenia. I mean, I think on, on the defense industry, it, it is going, going to take massive amounts of uh, international investment with partners of Armenia who believe. I, I really like what Anna said. If, if, the, if Sunik is that important to the world as a crossroads, 
than the US, France, India, uh, other countries, and then they're gonna line up should invest heavily in, in the uh, defense industry in Armenia. Put up or shut up. That's right. We have more chat questions, but I wanted to open it up to anybody in person if they have any questions they'd like to ask. You can step up to the mic. Is it on? Hi. Um, so I have a question about Armenia's current status and how we relay that message with everything else that we're relaying. We've seen a lot of protests since the loss of Artsakh land um, in Yerevan and people's dissatisfaction, to put lightly, with the government. How do we go about getting our message to the Western world that we need support, but also um, making it clear that there is unrest, but not making it seem that we aren't worth the investment and that it's not a lost cause uh, internally? Yeah, I, I think, and great question, by the way. Uh, I think Armenians are very hard on themselves. I mean, we're a democracy. Democracies are messy. Yeah. You have protests in democracies, and that's okay. You know, I once was involved with a hotel in, in Yerevan, which was right in the center of Republic Square, and I used to tell the ambassador, uh, the U.S. ambassador, if I were to own a hotel in, in Kiev, in Tbilisi, in Baku, or Yerevan, I still would take Yerevan, because that hotel has never stopped operating. There's been protests in the square. People give out water from the hotel after the protest. It does, I mean, we are a really good people. Okay, you are all good people. Armenians are not going at each other for no reason. When you lose a war, there's a lot of frustration. What, what, what I think we need to do is always look at what do our enemies want us to do? Do they want us to be divided? Do they, do they want us to be at each other's throats? Of course. What do we do? We basically, we draw lines and we say, look, we don't like where we are today, but in a democracy, there are ways to solve that problem. I don't like where we are in the United States, but there are way to solve, there's ways of solving it. So just equate the shared values of your values here as a US citizen to the Armenian values. Some of the brightest young people in the world are in Armenia. They're gonna have a great chance to flourish, but we have to make sure that the world understands that that is a, a society worth investing in. Can I add to that? It's such an important point, Anthony. Uh, after the 2020 war, the 44-day war, which was also as traumatizing and devastating in a very different way, you might remember the political crisis, much higher level. Every single Western analyst, my colleagues, co-authors, on a Armenian democracy is going to fall. This is the end of it. And I'm, again, um, I do find research therapeutic, I have to admit. So I'm looking at the data, there is pretty solid evidence that those democratic transitions, always remember this is very unique to Armenia. Georgia doesn't have it, Ukraine doesn't have it, and that's part of the reason as to why their fabric is so polarized. Those democratic transitions that happen through civic, nonviolent disobedience campaigns have higher chances of consolidating. And I could never be, I have never been so more, more proud than that Armenia overcome that very intense political crisis through the ballot box. Armenia found its way into the ballot box. And I remember telling each one of the Western analysts that no, this is what's gonna happen. I do think Armenia f will find its way into the ballot box. And right, democracies are messy, indeed. And I remember 2021, I was in Armenia, there were still tents out there. Now I'm like forgetting which process we're talking about. And I went in the morning just trying to see, and then there are tourists strolling by the tents. And I felt very proud that this is the country in which I live in. Before 2018, the Velvet Revolution, there's still protests. Armenia was ranked <laughs> um, with, by scholars who study this in the post-Soviet region per share, the country that had the highest level of protest. But also, it was predicted to have the, the most stable autocracy. That did not work out. But what was interesting, when I would watch the small protest, the big protest, the small protest for uh, transportation, price hike, water, this and that, there are like young people like yourself. These people would block the Bagramian street, sleep there overnight, in the morning, get up, 
like clean all around them. Uh, they would have a station to make the posters. It was such level of organizing, such level of volunteerism. And now you see that happening uh, after the uh, Armenians started coming from Artsakh, you see that same level of energy. Soviet system wiped that out of us. And now you see that coming and Armenia reconnecting with its pre-Soviet very rich culture of, of, uh, civic, uh, of civic skills. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, I think I fully agree with that. Uh, so yeah, Armenia's democracy is very special, very different, but obviously it's a young democracy, institutions are still weak, so you do need to work in making sure that ever the conflicts and disagreements are solved institutionally, through the ballot box, through the institutions. So yeah, I'll stop here. I got too overheated. <laughs> um, we have a couple more questions um, related to that, two of which are centered around the Armenian government. Uh, one is post-2020 Karabakh war, the Armenian military was so weakened it could no longer defend Karabakh. Is the Armenian military still so weak it could not adequately defend Sunik if war broke out? That's a concern, yes. Um, basic, well, I mean, we, we, we face a couple of, uh, of major uh, issues. Number one is lack of strategic and military planning. Azerbaijan has constantly been militarizing, has been spending more and more money on its military. Armenia is unable to spend as much as them, but even what it does spend is questions as to whether it's being spent well, whether it's actually getting where it could, where it should be. So one of the issues we've had longstanding, of course, is corruption. Um, there, there were some small moves towards, uh, towards uh, reducing corruption uh, three, four years ago. Unfortunately, we don't know how much, I mean, we know that's been, that was part of the problem in 2020, is years of corruption had uh, made sure that a lot of things that should have got to the front didn't. Um, so that's one, that's one major concern. And the other is, is just the strategic planning. Um, not having your own industry, being dependent on Russian weaponry when Azerbaijan is getting Turkish, Israeli, Ukrainian, and everything else uh, leaves you at a disadvantage as well. So that is a concern, um, and it's one that you know we need to, we need to be making sure that the Armenian government takes seriously. Um, related to that question, the next one is: Does the Ar does Armenia's current government bear any responsibility for the loss of Artsakh? How confident are you that they will rise to the challenge of keeping our homeland? I would say that we all bear. Uh, responsibility for the loss of Artsakh. The one thing I've been tired of is people pointing fingers. I think we all bear the responsibility. Uh, those in Armenia and a diaspora that was pretty well comfortable going to Armenia and enjoying the fruits of Armenia but not really investing in the, uh, the military infrastructure, certain things. I mean, certain things we can't do. But I would say this. If you go to Armenia and you help develop an institution, as Anna said, that would be the best thing you could do. Help give jobs. Bring bring the economy of Armenia up, uh, and the government shares in that. Next time you write a check to Armenia, I would be careful if you are one of the big leaders of, of the diaspora to ask the right questions, because you're not gonna invest in a country that isn't on the right track. So I think everybody needs to be a little more sober and, and be uh, analytical about how we work in the future with Armenia, not to say we're gonna hold them hostage, but certainly you wanna make sure that we're not buying another G-Wagon for somebody. I, uh, follow up on that question. I think it's safe to say everyone bears uh, uh, a fault in, in the situation. Arguably, the second largest atrocity in, in modern Armenian history. I think every institution from inside the Republic to every diaspora institution down to the the smallest NGO is to blame. All for all intents and purposes, we failed for the last 30 years to fortify Armenia to protect Artsakh in this situation. So why is the current administration uh, completely null and void and, and immune to that kind of criticism? What do you say to people that say Pashinyan should step down to salvage anything that's left of Armenian sovereignty? So uh, I believe everyone is to blame, but why should they be immune to any criticism from, from the beginning? Let me take that. Um, I think it's very important that Armenia is governed by leaders that are elected them. So right now, I, I don't know the man. Um, he's to me, I, I think, to be honest, and I'm a voter. Um, 
is a mediocre politician. He was an amazing movement leader that succeeded that democratic breakthrough without a single blood, and that's, which could have moved Armenia into a serious scenario. But having said that, I think when we say supporting institutions, and if that means working through the institutions, his popularity has already declined, but that it's behoo it, it, that right to topple him, or not topple, topple actually is the really wrong word. It's the right of Armenian citizens to vote him down. Those decisions need to happen in the ballot box. During the, after the 2020 war, there was that whole movement, uh, the save years, right? There were like 17 parties or so. That was the scariest thing to me for Arme for Arme uh, in Armenian history because that would be a step back. So while we feel very strongly about this or that leader, I think our, the bigger problem which this focus on Nikol Pashinyan deviates from is that Armenia lacks a strong opposition. And Armenian politicians, unfortunately, in Armenia, they don't do retail politics. They don't do the door-to-door, -door, build a political party. There are tons of issues in Armenia, huge issues of social inequality. During this last uh, uh, elections for the, uh, for, the Yerevan, um, uh, for the Yerevan city government, uh, uh, Pashinyan's party already lost, right? And that's, before that, during the local elections, again, uh, the Ar Pashinyan's party was on back footing. These are healthy signs, but Armenia's challenge is building a strong opposition. They can offer an alternative. So um, it's tempting, and I realize emotions are strong, but toppling or moving and having him step down, if that happens institutionally, if there is a push for it, that's fine. But if you stop working the institutions, that's through the institutions, through the elections, which have been actually getting strong even before the Velvet Revolutions. Uh, we have been uh, working with all kinds of groups in uh, working on electoral regime. That will be the end of it. Uh, electoral politics, institutions is the engine to our car. It, you can get a different driver, but if you don't keep your engine up to date, it's a simple analogy, that's how, that's how I'm thinking about statehood. Statehood sovereignty is at that ballot box in addition, obviously, to the territorial sovereignty. But that's a hugely important fight. We let it go, we will lose the Armenian state. So we just have to be patient. Democracy is messy and it does take time. I think, uh, to answer your question, uh, it depends on where you sit. I've always, I've known every president and prime minister of Armenia. But my job is to advocate for them. People ask me, oh, which one do you like? I, my job isn't to like someone. My job is to put them in the best light to do what's best for Armenia. I'm not, I am not, a, a, I don't vote in Armenia, so therefore I really don't have a direct, I mean, if anybody brings harm to Armenia and I could stop it, I would stop it probably behind closed doors. But I think Anna's right, Our, you know, we outside of Armenia, and this, is a, a, this could be another topic, you know, your job is to support the statehood and the people. If you want to go in and vote and become a citizen, that, like I, I criticize American politics and I go door to door and I work on political campaigns because this is my country where I vote and this is my citizenship. I, I, I really am careful when it comes to Armenia. My job is to always support the best interests of the institutions of Armenia from afar and not interfere in their internal politics. Yeah, I, I just add to that that it's, yes, it's up to the people of Armenia to hold the present administration responsible for its mistakes and missteps regarding Artsakh. Uh, they have to decide on that, but at the same, and, and there were plenty, but at the same time we have to point out this is not, it hasn't just been the last three years that it's been a problem. The military uh, degradation has been long lasting. The, the failures of diplomacy have been going back two decades now. I mean, diplomatically, we should have been in a much better position than we have, and that's not just the Pashinyan administration, it's not just Serge Sarkisha, not just Kocha. We can go all the way back to Levon and just point out all the mistakes. Um, I would just point out one. Um, I mean, the single biggest problem we as working as political activists in the diaspora for Artsakh was when Artsakh was, the people of Artsakh was removed as part of 
the negotiations over the peace negotiations, right? The Europeans were overseeing it. It was the Armenian, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Artsakh. Who allowed Artsakh to be taken out? Robert Kocharya. That was the single biggest diplomatic blunder of the last 50 years of Armenian history. And so, yeah, we can't, you know, I, I don't want to get into personality. Again, we're here in the diaspora. We have limitations. The Armenian people have to hold the Armenian government responsible. It's up to them to do it. I hope they do so. I hope they have a robust discussion of it. And the demonstrations, it's all for the good. But the bottom line is every Armenian administration has to be held responsible, and they can't just hold power through uh, coercion or through deals with oligarchs or whatever else it might be. Is it related to this topic or a different topic? Before we move on to that, there's just a question that's been in the chat for like 20 minutes. I want to ask really quickly. Um, should be relatively quick. This is directed towards you, Dikran, about the um, people moving to the border towns. Um, who do you expect to move to these border towns? Um, even those coming from Artsakh are being offered housing in Sunik and refusing it because of fear of being displaced twice. Say that last part again. Um, even those coming from Artsakh are being offered housing in Sunik and refusing it out of fear of being displaced twice. Yeah, uh, and it's understandable, right. I mean, they're traumatized. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that's part of the problem is that, you know, you don't, they don't want to be hit by the same thing again because they don't know. I mean, they're seeing the same thing as we are. So, yes, that is, that is a major concern. Um, but that's, you know, perhaps you, you know, perhaps offer them something outside of Sunik in one of the other parts of Armenia that's a rural area. I mean, but that's, again, it's got to be part of a, a nationwide strategy. Where has that repopulation of rural area strategy been for the last 30 years of Armenian independence? It's not there. Why haven't we been building it up? It's much easier. Just let everyone flow into Yerevan. It's easier, politically, it's easier to control them. And, you know, economically, eh, well, you know, they'll do whatever they do. So, I mean, that is the real um, obstacle there. But a number of Armenians had moved into border areas in Artsakh. Hopefully some of them will, will do so there. And if not, let's find other rural areas if they're from rural areas and, and, uh, and that's where they're economically they can survive in Armenia. Thank you. Um, anyone with in-person questions, feel free to line up at the microphone. I just want to thank all three of you for coming and speaking for us. Um, thank you for your opinions, for you know, the information you're sharing. Um, I just have like a couple comments and uh, just a question for all of us to think about. Um, it's just that when you read the news on, uh, online and the articles, you see a lot of things that the U.S. and the U.S. press is getting away with. Their language, their euphemisms, um, their, sh their phraseology is really, I think, inappropriate for the situation. And I think um, we should do more about that. Um, and then another thing is that um, we as U.S. citizens have an like, obligation to make our voices heard to the government. So if we're not going to go be in Yerevan and serve in Goris and, you know, fight in the army, we have to come and, you know, do something and speak to our own government, you know. They went, they had military um, exercises there. Armenia turned away from Russia, you know. So this is kind of an opportunity for us to, you know, to proclaim our democracy talk about that, you know, talk to our U.S. government, our representatives. What are some ways that we can start really capitalizing on this, you know, this point in time? Before they take Sunik, before they take more territory, we have this short period of time to act and to do something. So we, we can go out and protest, we can tell our colleagues, but they're not representatives. They're probably not going to call their representatives. What can we do? We are, a, we are a big body. We are a lot of people here, Armenians in New England, California, all over the United States. We need to have a message, something systematic. What can we do? So, good question. Um, last week, we were in Washington. We had probably 80 people on the Hill, and we did about 300 meetings, okay? That was the Diocese, the Prelacy, AGBU, Knights of Artan, Bar Association, Armenian Assembly, and I'm probably missing 10 organizations, 75 people. Interestingly enough, the Ukrainians were say, said, this was about a year ago, and by the way, last year we had a big event with Nancy Pelosi, the day she stepped out as, as speaker. This year we honored um, Paul Ignatius, who was the highest ranking Navy officer, Secretary of the Navy under Johnson. So here's what I would say. The Ukrainians were boasting to us at last year's event 
they had a huge number. They had 150 people, okay? APAC has 10,000 people come. So I think we all need to readjust our thinking here. If we really care, next time the ANC or the assembly or hopefully together with the diocese and the prelacy and everybody else says come to Washington, there should be 5,000 Armenians there because it does matter. When you walk into Catherine Clark or Ed Markey's office or better yet, uh, some Midwest uh, uh, senator or congressman's office with 20 people and 10 kids, they take notice. So I'm gonna say to your, to your uh, next time, because there will be within s probably six months, try to get to DC. If you need money to go because you're young and you don't have the money, and I'm not talking to you, but I'm just talking to anyone, call us because we will get you there. I mean, this is something, this is a failure uh, as a US citizen, I think we have to look at. We really do need to up our game in, uh, in the work in Washington. And there's an entire playbook there. And believe me, the Azaris have played it well. The problem is they can't do what we do. They don't have constituents. They buy it, okay? They pay hard cash, a billion dollars, to get in all those papers, okay? We can do much better, and we should do better. And, and I think you're starting to get the sense that there is a, a groundswell among all of you. Okay, it's now time to stop talking and, and, and start acting. Could I, that's, that's, that's such a good question. I fully agree with everything that Anthony said. Two random thoughts, half-baked, but I'm, I have, they have been in my mind, so I'm gonna throw it out <laughs> so maybe someone can um, explore a little. Number one, I think we need to go back to the drawing board and uh, study how to build social movements in the 21st century. Uh, there's science to this. What are the strategies? What's the agenda? It's not, I haven't researched that, but I, there's science to this study in other cases. Um, understanding, uh, we, you have AI now, right? How is it gonna affect the way we organize, the way we should organize? So I don't know, there are a lot of questions. I think we just really, maybe NASA can sponsor someone to look at this question <laughs> to do a research project. And number two, it's very important to coordinate the messaging, as you said. Anthony already pointed out, this is a democracy. This is an old democracy. It's an old statehood. We like to say we're the first Christian nation, but right now, and there's, we have some amazing historians who have, who have produced one to my right. The Armenia's pre-Soviet history, the first republic is fascinating. So they're very solid foundations of democracy. So essentially being focused on the message, but also coordinating with the Armenian state. I was reviewing this book on diaspora effectiveness. Armenia was one of the cases, and I never thought about this. One of the findings of the book that those diaspora communities that frame their issues to the uh, target governments in a way that, is benef that, comes, that, that falls a bit clearly with the interests of that state, then they tend to be effective. Meaning understanding, okay, what can I ask? from the American government. I mean, when I listen through every hearing after hearing, right, that Anthony put so much time putting it together, you see always the congressional members versus the executive, right? They don't necessarily speak closely. You see the same dynamic in the European Parliament. The executive branch is doing these horrendous things, uh, and it's also trying to build a peace process, right? While the parliament is very upset for understandable reasons and is issuing these human rights focused statements, right? Uh, but then at the same time, the executive branch is trying to build a peace process while also selling oil to uh, Azerbaijan. So I think understanding what the interests are of United States and then figuring out what can we ask and how can we ask it. So that's my two cents on it. Thanks a lot for the fascinating conversation. Uh, sorry for going back to Aliyev and uh, his narratives, but I'm really struggling with this question. So it looks like he's not only satisfied and his ambition is not only Sunik, but he's actively introducing this narrative of uh, repopulating uh, forcibly re di displaced Azeri po um, population back to Armenia. and. Even he stops using the term Armenia per se, but calling it Western Azerbaijan and so-called Armenia, what's today is called Armenia. I was wondering what are your thoughts on how serious we should take these narratives, this threat, and if we do take it seriously, what are the ways to 
counter this and prevent this from happening. Thank you. Well, I mean, I would just start by saying, just as Erdogan's mouth sometimes is our best weapon, Aliyev's mouth should be our, a good weapon for us as well. The worse his rhetoric gets, now that the West has actually seen, oh yeah, you guys, yeah, maybe you guys were right, yeah, there was ethnic cleansing, you only were telling us about it for 10 years. Now is the time to say, look at this guy. I mean, everything that Anna said about him being an autocrat to begin with, being a her hereditary dictator, um, everything he's, all of his irrational rhetoric now has to be turned against him and saying, this is what we're dealing with, this is what we've been telling you, Armenia itself is a danger, you do have an obligation, because Armenia's borders are internationally recognized, now is the time to crack down on Aliyev. To sanction, I mean, how about, how, isn't now the time to put sanctions on Azerbaijan again? It's, it, and, and so each time, you know, right now he's cocky, yeah, he won. So he's gonna shoot off his mouth and each one of those things have to be repeated over and over again to every senator, every congressman, and especially down at the State Department, the Defense Department. Those are the two parts of the American government that are the biggest obstacles. They're the most allied with, you know, who follow Turkey, who follow Azerbaijan too much. And so I think we just take everything he say, we blow it up on big posters and we hand it to them. Yeah, I agree with that. I also would also add uh, one thing that I'm not seeing Armenian government doing a whole a lot is the diplomacy with countries in Africa and Latin America is really important. I mean, every UN Security Council meeting you watch, we, it, we, it's tempting to dismiss them. These are not powerful states. But the norms for territorial integrity, protecting that border, you've got to invest in the norms. It sounds fuzzy. They're, they matter. They work. So developing Turkey has opened over 150 embassies in Africa. Russia is courting the African state on the anti-colonial message. The West is the colonizer. My, in my invasion in Ukraine is an anti-colonial war. So, uh, and I don't know, I haven't, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't seen anything substantive, but I do think Armenia does need to build very solid diplomatic relations uh, with smaller states, which are stakeholders for state sovereignty, in addition to building up the, the defense, of course. Which, which goes uh, without saying. Thank you very much, the panelists, everybody for coming. Thank you for your questions. These conversations must continue in our communities. Um, and we encourage you to be activists in your communities. I listed a few protests coming up. Um, and Anthony, as Anthony said, coming to activism in Washington, D.C. is meaningful. Um, out of respect for everyone's time, we're going to end the official panel here. Um, but I'm sure our panelists can say after if they want to take any individual questions. But thank you very much for coming.